All right, we're going to be looking at reproduction, the topic that everyone has been waiting for. Look at this wonderful title page. Reproduction. Before we go on, ask yourself, what is the point of reproduction? Just what is the point? How do all the different types of living things out there reproduce? Uh, mushrooms, they reproduce. What's the point? To feed my pizza hunger? Hmm? Human reproduction. Ah, okay. I'm a little embarrassed to go on to the next section, but we're going to try. Can you tell if this is a man or a woman? If you can tell, then you're off to a good start. We're going to be talking about each of these things in a little more, little bit more detail, but believe it or not, you have to be able to draw this diagram. Now, this is a side view of a woman, and uh, let's just name some of the bits here. Ovary. From the side view, you can only see one, but actually there are two ovaries. Hopefully, you know that already. Oviduct, eggs that are released, uh, ovum, ovum is another word for an egg that are released, they travel down the oviduct. You may know it by the term fallopian tube. If you'd write fallopian, make sure to capitalize it. It's named after G. Fallopio, some Italian uh, biologist, I think. Uh, the uterus is this particular area here where the implanted egg will actually develop and turn into a embryo and a fetus. We have the cervix. The cervix is the opening from the uterus into the vagina. Uh, this area is the vagina. That's the area where sperm is actually deposited during copulation when a man and woman are trying to have a baby. The bladder is just shown here for location. This does not contribute to reproduction at all, as far as I know. Large intestine, it's just to show the relative situations. Can you tell which side is the front and which side is the back? Hopefully. And vulva is just the opening or the front of this entire female reproductive system. The urethra is just the tube that allows urine to pass through. So these are the three openings uh, in this area of the female body. So make sure you understand what all of these things. We're going to be looking at some of these in more detail. Okay, can you tell if this is a man or a woman? Very good. Is this a front view or a side view? Very good. You can see this is the curvature of the buttocks from the Latin word. I don't know. Also here shown for relative positioning the bladder. Now you'll notice here the bladder uh, contains the urine, but the urine is going to leave the body. The funny thing about the male reproductive system or the male system here is that urine and sperm come out through the same opening. You may have questions. Post them online. And I'll try to answer them. The prostate, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. The prostate and the seminal vesicles produce fluids that help to nourish and keep the sperm safe. The epididymis, uh, let's get a few of these things here together. Okay, so the scrotum, so this sac which contains the testicles or the testes, the testes here from side view, you can only see one. I hope this doesn't confuse you uh, to think that most men only have one testicle. That is not true. It's supposed to be a pair. There are two testicles. Singular is testis. If they're plural, then this changes to an E. You have testes. They're also called testicles as well. Uh, this is where the sperm are developed. The epididymis is a place where the sperm mature and become able to swim, basically. And you can see they take this path around here. What a big, long, unnecessary path in order to, in order to come around here. But part of the path is to pick up some of these extra fluids here. The foreskin, which is, of course, attached oops, uh, to the penis. And the urethra is this tube here which through which sperm semen and uh, urine actually travels and the penis contains erectile tissue we won't be talking about the specifics of human reproduction but in human reproduction something happens here in order for something to happen so that's something something sorry it's not in the syllabus so i'm not going to talk about it and a uh, sperm duct is the uh, this is the tube that the sperm has to travel uh, with fluids added at these locations becoming semen and then it exits through here when we're trying to make a baby. All right, so those are the main human reproductive parts. What you should do is you should go back and then just try to sketch these, just practice drawing them in a notebook, but don't let people see you because they'll think you're crazy. But you have to be able to draw this and uh, you can, if you want to use a different diagram, 
as long as it's anatomically correct, you're okay. Front view is fine as well too. These are side views. All right. Let's take a look at the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is something that's very, very important. It's not um, well understood by 50% of our human race because half of us are men and maybe they don't know much about it or what they do know about it is totally wrong. But once you start thinking about reproduction, it's very, very important. And it's really, really cool stuff. So it turns out that some animals, some mammals don't actually menstruate, but humans do. And a lot of primates do as well, too. Um, the thing about some of these types of mammals is that they don't menstruate, but they are kind of on heat. On heat maybe is their, means they're, they're ready to reproduce at specific times of the year. Okay, So during those particular seasons, and they may be very short windows, over, over 365 days we're talking about, maybe only a few months that they're actually capable of reproducing, uh, why do you think that's a good reproductive strategy for them? Think about that in terms of energy and energy wasted. Humans and primates shed their uterine lining once every 28 days or so. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on here that relates to uh, psychology and evolutionary psychology as well too. But the idea here for primates is that we can pretty much reproduce all year round all year round, but as we'll find later, not in this video, but or as we're going to find out later, um, that is not as easy as it sounds, not as easy as it sounds. Okay, so uh, we're going to switch over to a cool little animation here from MSNBC, so check it out. Uh, I'm not going to read through the entire thing here, but let's just look at this basic diagram. You may have seen this before, I've been using this for a very, very long time. So the average human menstrual cycle is approximately 28 days, some longer, some shorter. Remember, this is just the average. The length of the period or during the time during which bleeding occurs, the average is also five days, but it could be three, it could be uh, eight. And some people could be far outside of that region. But in general, here's the diagram. Here's what we're looking at here. This is the uterus. This is the uterine lining. Here's an ovary, and when an egg or an ovum gets released, it's going to travel down here, hoping to meet sperm sometime during this stage here. And if it doesn't, it's going to leave the body here. If it does, it's going to get fertilized, and it's going to come and implant in the wall here. And hopefully, it will be nice and thick and ripe with all kinds of nutrients and blood vessels and capillaries ready to deliver nutrients and oxygen. So uh, let's see what happens. During the first five days of the period, this is where the bleeding happens. And look at that menstrual, that uh, uterine wall is shedding. So the blood, the capillaries, the tissues, everything that's been built up here is getting wasted and leaving the body because it takes a lot of energy to maintain this if you're not pregnant. That's one of the ways that uh, women find out that they could possibly be pregnant because their period doesn't come and this doesn't break down. So uh, one more time, during the first five days, you can see right here and the egg that was released did not get fertilized, so it leaves the body along with the uterine wall. During the next, uh, couple, the next week or so, up to around day 14, various hormones are released. We're going to talk about these in more detail. Uh, we're talking about estrogen and progesterone, and they help to build this wall back slowly in preparation for fertilization, if that happens. Magic number, right around day 14, this is average as well too, right around day 14, a particular hormone called LH, luteinizing hormone, we'll talk about this later, don't worry, just to get the general idea here, uh, stimulates the one of these ov ova, one of these ova to be released. And it's surrounded by a bunch of these follicle cells or chaperone cells. And once it gets released, now it's ready to be fertilized. And it's traveling down this path over here, okay? For the next two weeks after ovulation takes place, ovulation takes place, we are hoping to get fertilized if we're a man and woman trying to have a baby. If not, then uh, it could actually break down. So here's what actually happens. If it does meet a sperm cell, it becomes a zygote, and then it starts to divide. This is called an embryo at this point. And then it will eventually come down here and find a home and implant in the uterine wall there. Meanwhile, more hormones are being uh, released to actually keep this wall nice and thick. If there is no sperm cell that comes through, 
then it actually goes through the same process and we're back to the beginning and everything gets shed. So when a woman starts having her period, or when a girl starts having her period around the age of, I don't know, 11, 12, or 13, typically in our human societies, we're not really encouraging young girls to get pregnant and have babies when they are 11 or 12. So maybe let's say a woman doesn't get pregnant until she's 23. That means between the age of 12 and 23, she's gonna have a period uh, 12 times a year for maybe 10, 10 to, to 15 years um, if she actually ends up having a baby eventually. But so this wall gets built up, broken down, built up, broken down, built up, broken down. And it seems like such a waste of energy. But the truth is, it is more efficient for the woman's body to build up the wall and then break it down if she's not going to get pregnant and then wait again uh, to, to build it back up. It's like saying, let's build a school. Ah, if no students come this particular month, we didn't pick up enough students. Let's just knock down the whole school. Let's build it up next month again and then see if we can attract some students. Okay, now let's break it, tear, tear it down again. It seems really wasteful in, with my stupid analogies, but in terms of the human body, uh, the woman's body, it's much more efficient to do that and you end up saving a lot of, a lot of energy. Uh, so let's go ahead and quickly look at uh, a diagram form of this. You can see this is showing a quite a, diff a few different things here, but uh, you can come back and look at this diagram in a second. This is showing the relative thickness of the uterine wall, and then you have four hormones. But before we get there, I want you to remember one word. If you're ever in trouble, if you're ever in trouble, there's one thing to yell out to help with reproduction, and that is if you're in trouble, you yell out the word Felp. You say Felp, Felp, Felp. Okay? I know that's, that's stupid. All right. Anyways, F and L are two hormones that are produced by the pituitary, pituitary gland, and E and P represent two hormones that are produced by the ovaries, and their names are, F stands for follicle stimulating hormone, but you can be cool and say FSH. E stands for estrogen. Uh, some if you're in from the UK, they spell this with an O in, in the front, but it's still pronounced estrogen, I think. I don't think they go O estrogen. L stands for luteinizing hormone, but you can abbreviate by just saying LH, capital LH. And P stands for progesterone. And this is the order in which the hormones peak. The order in which the hormones peak, as you'll see in the following diagram right here. So. Uh, when you're looking at the menstrual cycle, the first hormone to peak is F. I remember FELP, okay? And then FSH kind of drops off. The next hormone to peak is E, which is estrogen, and estrogen helps to rebuild the uterine lining, and then it kind of falls off. And then L, which stands for LH, the hormone LH peaks. That's what causes ovulation, and then that drops down. And then the final FELP, P progesterone, then starts to rise to continue to maintain the uterine lining, and then uh, that drops down if she doesn't get pregnant and the whole cycle starts all over again. That is the general outline of how these hormones change during the menstrual cycle. And believe it or not, that one word, felp, can be very, very useful for you uh, in your daily life and, of course, to help you with understanding the menstrual cycle and answering any questions that come up. So uh, let's see. Here's a diagram that shows you how some of these things are, are combining together. So what are we looking at here? Uh, so this peak, whenever I see a tall peak, I know that's L. And guess what? That's actually day 14. Boom. Day 14, LH. And so this first peak right here is going to be F or FSH. This next peak here, which happens slightly before this one, is going to be estrogen. That's L. And then that's P right there. So take a look at these little mountains here. Okay, FSH levels rise, the follicle develops, the follicle has the uh, ovum inside, has the ovum inside. Estrogen levels start to rise uh, to build up the uterine wall and to stimulate LH to be released. LH level peaks and causes ovulation, and so the follicle turns after, okay, the follicle releases the ovum, so the egg starts traveling down the oviduct, and then the follicle turns into something called a corpus luteum. Make a note of this. This is Latin for yellow body. I don't know. It's so offensive. Yellow body. I guess it just looked really ugly, but it still continues to secrete some 
hormones still continues to secrete hormones and that, that specific hormone is progesterone and it actually keeps the uh, uterine lining nice and thick okay a lot of information here level falls off if no embryo is formed so that's a, a typical question that might be asked if you see progesterone fall at the end then she didn't get pregnant if the progesterone level remains high if it remains high then she is pregnant fertilization has happened you don't want if you get pregnant you want progesterone to stay high because if progesterone stays stays high then the uterine wall stays thick if progesterone drops then the uterine wall breaks down and then you have a bad situation so that's a miscarriage and miscarriages can happen where a where fertilization does happen a zygote actually implants into the into the uterine wall but something happens hormonal imbalances or uh, an accident or physical uh, physical trauma and that can actually cause the uterine wall to break down and if it breaks down then there's no place for that um, fertilized egg the zygote the embryo to hang on to and so that actually uh, ends up leaving the body and dying that's called a miscarriage i guess that's why many people many of my friends i guess we don't really find out that they're pregnant until they're maybe three months in because uh if they just get the pregnancy test and then announce it to the whole world you know there's still a chance that something may may go wrong and that would be a very uh, sad situation so yeah, most people tend to wait a little bit longer before announcing to everybody that that's happening. Okay, FSH rises again, starting the next cycle. And I think we can end it right there. All right, post any questions you have about the menstrual cycle and general questions about bits and bobs. And make sure you know how to draw some pictures of male and female reproductive systems. Okay.